be recorded. Bewitching hours. So I'm going to call the South Burlington City Council meeting of December 18th, 2023 to order. And we'll begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, given the weather, I hope everyone is safe. And thankfully, they can join by, um, you know, virtually and not have to go out in their car. Or, as in Barb's case, um, from afar. Uh, second item is introductions on exiting building in case of emergency and review of the technology options. So for those joining us in the room, you can go out, um, if there's an emergency, you can go out either side of the rear of the auditorium and then turn left or right to get outside. Uh, for those participating online, thank you for joining us. Um, if you would like to be recognized during any agenda item, please turn your camera on or uh, indicate in the chat that you'd like to comment and I'll have the chair call on you. Other than that, we are not monitoring the chat for content. Thank you. Okay, item three is the agenda review. Are there any um, additions, deletions, or changes in the order of agenda items? Seeing none, um, all those um, in favor of adopting this agenda signify by saying aye. 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 So the agenda is as uh, presented. Um, next is comments and questions from the public not related to the agenda. So are there any in the auditorium? Okay, seeing none. How about from home? Uh, quiet night, seeing none. So we'll move on to counselor's announcements and reports on committee assignments, followed by the city manager's report. Thank you. So um, do you want to start, Andrew? Happy to. So I attended the um, bike ped committee and the energy committee meetings. Um, both had a wonderful update on our transportation demand management plans, which basically are a set of requirements, some options that scale depending upon the size of development that um, with the hope that those requirements and options will reduce the vehicle miles traveled by the residents. So, for instance, someone may choose to put um, a sheltered bike parking, someone may choose to have um, spaces that favor um, high high occupancy vehicles, um, a developer may choose to join CATMA, give reduced transit passes, a whole menu of options um, that are intended to do that. So that's, that's exciting. Um, both committees gave, I think, really good feedback on um, on those uh, suge gave suggestions, ideas, and I expect it will be before us at, at some point. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, Bike Ped also had a robust discussion about Patchen Road and um, issues that some residents encounter mm -hmm. on Patchen Road with um, speeding and folks kind of turning unexpectedly or when they're not supposed to and close calls with residents, so it was a robust discussion about what can be done about patch and road, include traffic calming, improved intersections, and things like that, so um, that's also something to look forward to. Um, the energy committee, again, spent some time with the TDM and also spent some time talking about this exciting um, climate change book club project. You may have seen the announcement in the other paper, um, four books, two in the spring, to next fall. So that's, I think, a really good way to educate, discuss, and engage with folks about climate change and our environmental issues that we face. Great. And Thank you. Excellent books. I read them both. Great books. Tim. Yes, thank you. Um, I attended the budget retreat on Friday. And uh, I also went to the economic development meeting uh, last mm, Tuesday, I think it was. Um, 
and they uh, elected some officers, uh, and there was general discussion. And I also uh, informed them about some of the feedback the city council had about the $400,000 for a, a kind of a daycare type fund. So that's going to be under some review, I think, about how they would like to structure that. So but they better talk about it soon. <laughs> Yes, yeah. they better get it structured if they want it to happen. Okay, um, Megan. Um, just to add on to the budget retreat, I did go to the senior holiday celebration, uh, the, the handbells portion of it, oh, not nice. the meal. And it was really lovely. And so I, I really want to thank Rebecca and her staff help. Uh, I know that, um, is it um, Adam? I think Adam was there as well, um, and I think Travis was there as well, and it was just beautiful. It was an hour of beautiful music with people singing along, and nice. just kind of friendly banter back and forth between the audience and the performers, so I was really, yeah, looking forward to being a full-fledged med <laughs> and going and going every year. It was nice. My grandmother used to play handball, so it was also very, oh, nice. kind of a... Okay. Good, good memory. Larry. Thank you. Um, I attended the Rec and Parks Committee meeting, uh, Adam's first uh, meeting as a, as a uh, department head. Uh, and what, uh, what I remember and I wrote down mostly had to do with their very spirited discussion about easement discussions at Hubbard. Uh, and I think that there will probably be follow-up from the committee about that. Not sure when that might happen, but okay. Okay, thank you. Good. All right. Um, I attended the um, common area for dog committee last Tuesday, followed by the planning commission and uh, common area for dogs. Um, they had no updates on Farrell Street. They're kind of waiting for the DRB to make a final. They think either administratively or as a um, a commission, um, the final design for the changing the bike path so that they then can work on the upgrades to Farrell Park. Mm -hmm. um, about Wheeler, um, there's a new sign for rules has been installed and a new bulletin board, which I think should help with some communications with the public um, about that dog park and eventually they're going to get a QR code sign with the hopes that and I think they have to work on it with the um, city clerk about people being able to use a Q you know one of those signs whatever they call it so people can make a, get information as well as um, make um, donations. contributions donations to uh, maintenance or whatever for the dog park. And we talked a little bit about how you might fundraise for that. Um, and we, um, Adam Math was there. It was his first time um, as the uh, uh, um, liaison with the, with the city. And um, he talked about, well, we talked about with him, the friends group, um, trees at Wheeler Park. We kind of brought him up to speed on all the things that the committee had talked about in the past and um, would like those amenities would like, they would like to have them done at the dog park. So, because there is money in the budget and so they're anxious to get some of it done. That was followed by a really interesting um, and delightful, I think, uh, planning commission meeting. Um, it was really talking about um, what are some of the possibilities, I guess, that will be required for our um, LDRs to meet the requirements of Act, I guess it's 42, S100, and um, some of the things around the climate um, plan and kind of laying out the the work that they will be doing in the next year which is substantial um and i i just have to say i, I just sitting in the audience and listening um it's it's really a, a very talented wonderful group of people 
I was very impressed with um, everyone, how they contributed, the way they contributed, and um, the level of conversation. So it was, it was nice to listen in and feel confident that we have some good minds working on um, what to do next. Mm -hmm. And then I also, you know, went to the retreat, which I also thought was really wonderful. And I, I, I really want to thank um, Jesse for the kind of leadership she offers this community in even organizing those kinds of retreats and conversation. It was um, a circle of all the um, department heads and the counselors, um, and it was a really nice conversation with lots of good questions, and it was not um, the kinds of conversations or hearings that you um, see on TV with the senators or the representatives or the board of select or the um, counselors kind of grilling someone and trying to get them to say something or admit admit something but rather um, in kind of an adversarial way this was um, you know I, I think a reflection of Jesse's um, leadership and it was just really nice to be part of that and I appreciate that can, can I add two things I forgot? Yes, you may. <clears throat> so I also, Friday night uh, after the uh, gathering uh, with the city people, um, went up to the uh, Veterans Memorial Park to see the holiday lights that Rexham Park put on. It's beautiful, beautiful display. Just one caveat, you know, if it's not frozen and not cold, wear boots. <laughs> it's, it's a little muddy in some places, but uh, the, yeah. the, the blue tunnel is really beautiful. And uh, the last thing is that uh, my wife met with the... Uh, some of the librarians on Friday discussing a new art project oh. and will not disclose any other details oh. until they can be disclosed. Suspense. Hmm? Suspense. Yes, it will be suspense. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Jesse. Uh, thank you. And thank you, Helen, for your really kind words. I also want to thank the council for your engagement during the budget retreat, sitting through uh, two and a half, three hours of PowerPoint presentations can be rough. And I was really impressed with how engaged you were. Great, you asked great questions and certainly questions that um, if you are wondering about the members of the community are too. So I think helped engage some of, uh, or helped uh, inform some of us how we talk about things. So thank you for that. Um, so much like uh, this meeting in July, I just want to take a moment to acknowledge that some of our municipal partners across the state are going through a lot of flooding tonight and hope they are okay. We have a number of roads closed here in our city and thankfully our public safety crews are out there ensuring everyone is safe. Um, Tangentially speaking of which, uh, today Chief Burke and I traveled to Waterbury to the state office complex for an all-day uh, meeting that the governor's office convened around public safety and community engagement. Um, there were representatives, there were probably um, 15 police chiefs in the room, managers, um, most of the AHS administration, much of the state police administration, legislators, judiciary folks, um, all talking about kind of statewide what's going on in our communities with our neighbors who are struggling and and the perception uh, perceptions around safe feeling safe in our communities. It was a really great conversation. Heard a lot from the state about what they intend to do um, and initiatives they're leading around community public safety. Uh, we were sent home halfway through it because Waterbury is flooding. Um, so it will continue on at a future date, but it was a really great event. And thanks to the governor's office for convening it. Um, I want to let the council know that we did not receive the first of the four um, federal grants we put forward for the bike ped bridge. As you may remember, Alana and Andy are working on um, actually five different applications, four of which are already in. Um, so this was the most competitive one that's on the was out in the in in the networks right now. But we did not receive that. But we will keep working at bringing in those additional funds to wrap up that project. Alana and I are also meeting first thing tomorrow morning with our state delegation to brief them on all things city center as well as potentially start talking about some state funding for that project because of its true um, regional benefit to Chittenden County. Um, 
want to give you two quick updates that we are trying to maximize next week and having things be a little slower. Uh, so we are doing a massive upgrade to laser fish uh, next Tuesday, the 26th. Um, we need, it's just a traditional kind of software upgrade. It will mean that laser fish is down for probably that full work day. Um, we're hoping that the 26th oh, is a day was... that not a lot of people are going to be looking for public <laughs> meeting documents. <laughs> so we'll see. But just heads up, if you're going in to try and find something, it will be down for the 26th. Council um, from 1968. <laughs> And then uh, additionally, Tom has um, arranged for the light um, infrastructure on Dorset Street to be put in in front of the school next week while school is not in session. So you will see them working on that intersection as well. Hmm. Uh, just a reminder to the community, the City Hall is closed on the uh, 25th. Public safety will be here obviously 24-7 for whatever members of our community may need. Um, we will be... Um, operating with uh, fewer staff next week to give people the opportunity to be with their families and friends. So we will still be open and here for business, but maybe a little slower with email responses. And then just a few fun things. Um, I'm glad you were able to attend the senior holiday uh, event. We had about 70 seniors here with us last week for That's that cool. event. It was lovely. Thank you for folks who participated in that. The senior center will be completely closed next week. Um, but looking ahead to fun things, the Valentine's Dance registration is open on our website if folks would like to sign up for that. And then <laughs> mark your calendars for April 5th and 6th. This will be our next Illuminate Vermont. As you might remember, last year we did Illuminate Vermont in December. It's um, really fun and interesting to, sit, to have a huge street fair in the middle of a snowstorm. So we are opting to try for a spring <laughs> event this year. So we could just do rain. <laughs> <laughs> just rain it's actually what we're actually trying to do illuminate vermont is um coordinate with the eclipse so it will be the weekend right before the eclipse so we mm -hmm. imagine that there will be lots of visitors to our region um that weekend going in, going into the tuesday of the eclipse so uh should be a fun time and a fun event for out-of-staters to come and see how great south burlington is and that's all i have great Thanks. thank you very much Okay, moving on to the consent agenda, we have six items, disbursements, uh, minutes from November 6th and December 4th, uh, the receipt of the November 20, uh, 2023 financials, an authorization for the submittal of applications to renew the city's new town center and neighborhood development area designations and approve the VTrans Transportation Alternatives Program grant application for the Spear Street Shared Use Path. And finally, approve a Vermont Humanities Rapid Response Grant to implement Vermont READS in 2023. So I'll move that we approve. Second. Is there any discussion or questions? All right. All in favor of the consent agenda as presented, signify by saying aye. 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 It's unanimous and is agreed to. Um, item seven will receive the Chinook County Planning Commission's um, annual report, and Charlie Baker's here. So welcome, Charlie. Oh, and Chris Shaw, excuse me. I'm sorry. That's right. You're our delegate. And who's the alternative? I am. And you are, Megan. So we got the Chris is so full regular. comport here. I've only gone once, I think. That's right. So uh, thank you very much for the time on your agenda. Good to see you all this evening. And uh, happy holidays. This is a little later than I usually try to get here, but uh, glad we finally were able to make it work. Um, and just context-wise, this is, I try to visit every fall to really do a customer service call and see how we're doing in terms of uh, providing services to the city in the way that you expect them. I'll kind of review and pause the re through uh, the report here. Um, the first page of the report gives you background to the history of the Regional Planning Commission and uh, a little bit about how we utilize your municipal dollars to leverage state and federal dollars coming into the region. And then your representatives. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Begit is an alternate. Um, so yeah, Steve is on our emergency management committee. Um, Tom and Paul are on committees also, and they're all uh, very active and uh, great representatives, as you might expect. So thank, thank them, thanks to them for their service. Um, the second section is really the meat of the report. 
uh, which lists uh, a page and a half or so of things that we engaged with you on in the last fiscal year, um, including uh, several things on the climate action work, um, some of which wrapped up last, you know, last fall, but uh, some which is still going on, uh, bike ped things, including the bike ped bridge over 89, um, and quite a bit of bike ped work, um, geographic information services, so mapping data, uh, technical assistance, uh, including reviewing regs and town plan or city plan in your case. Uh, we also have traffic accounts available and byways and a, just a little note on the E&D transportation service. So, but I'm going to pause. Uh, this, that was a whole long list of any feedback for me on how we were doing in terms of providing those services. And there's a wide range of those, but. Uh, just a comment. It's a lot. Yeah. So we really do <laughs> we, we um, use you, it seems, a, a lot. And we appreciate that. And um um, you know, I think it's an important relationship and appreciate what you can bring to the table. I was going to wait till you got to the CCCUD before I made my comment. Oh, excellent. <laughs> I'll say I work very closely with two of your staff, Melanie Needle and Ann mm -hmm. Janda, on the yes. Climate Action Plan, and they were fantastic. Uh, we not only could not, could we have not done it without them, but the the level of service was just really beyond. It was just amazing to work with them. Well, I really appreciate that. Thank you. I will pass that along. Thank you. And um, sorry, I should wait. Any for Any other next. comment? Yeah. No. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you. Um, the uh, in the middle of the third page, um, you also have a long list of things that are in our transportation improvement program, which mirrors the state transportation capital program. I'm not going to review all those. Uh, hopefully you've gotten updates over time from your own staff on a lot of these projects, but you have a lot of projects in the capital program. Um, and so it's more for your information to know that those are all out there. Um, and in some stage of progress, though, I guess the one thing I will note is, um, you know, I can't believe we're talking about flooding again <laughs> tonight. Um, you know, just after, was that five months ago? Um, or maybe four or five. Um, but one thing, and I haven't gotten an official communication from VTrans on this, but I am expecting that as a result of the work that VTrans has to do in repairing flood damaged roads and bridges and culverts, that probably the rest of the program, it's going to have an impact on the rest of the program. So I guess just as my sense, and I, again, I haven't heard this officially yet, but I wouldn't be surprised when the governor introduces his budget you know, like a month from now or so, that projects may slide back uh, to accommodate what they're having to do immediately in mm -hmm. this fiscal year and probably into next fiscal year. So um, that's just, um, so. and I say that also to anyone who's reading this and see the date on here, take it with a grain of salt, please. Um, if it mm -hmm. hasn't already started, it's likely to, um, I would not be surprised if it got delayed to some extent. Um, and then, um, uh, thank you. Uh, you mentioned kind of how much work we do together. Um, you have one request in this year's work program for the walk bike uh, master plan for the city. So, um, which was an unusually light year of requests from the city. Um, and I'm not encouraging you to give us a whole pile of them. <laughs> we but, can remedy uh, that yes, very um, easily. <laughs> we've already we've already talked to staff. We we know there's more coming uh, in the coming year, which is fine. <laughs> um, no, that's good. Um, and then, yeah, at the end are a lot of things that we do without regard to one specific municipality, regional activities, um, you know, equity work, economic development, housing, uh, energy, um, TDM. We are working on a regional TDM plan. I mentioned that as I heard you talking about that earlier. Um, emergency management, um, culverts, and all kinds of things. And the CUD, uh, which is a communications union district, um, is something last year we started supporting mm -hmm. uh, and helped that get formed. Uh, or get, help that get formed. Um, and thanks, Tim, for volunteering to uh, join that board. Appreciate it. Uh, you run a tight ship, <laughs> and you have a high level of expertise on your staff. And Angen does a great job, and, and so did you. And the people in that. Uh, that, that, you know, participate in that process, especially the one that was elected chair. Um, yeah, like I'm really Nance. impressed with the technical knowledge that they have. It's, and it, so it's really clear that that, I, I think that that district's going to make progress, you know. Good. Yeah. yeah, we have an RFP out there right now looking for uh, uh, the internet service provider to help fill in the gaps. So um, 
knock on wood, that we get some good responses to that. And Chris, I don't know if there's anything you want to add. Well, I think I'm here primarily to show my support as the board and your representative for South Burlington. I was fortunate to be elected uh, the chair of the executive board and the board, and we couldn't be more pleased with Charlie. Uh, we just had our audit come in, another clean audit. Uh, this has not been something 15 years ago we could have said, but over the last 10 years with uh, Charlie, and, and it's been really uh, a tight ship as much as you mentioned the CC. UD committee there, Tim. Uh, we're delighted uh, with Charlie. We're delighted with staff and his management of them. And we're particularly excited, I think. He did not mention the uh, equity engagement manager mm -hmm. that we brought on board. I attended the uh, equity advisory committee in, at the end of October. Um, and it's a great uh, uh, underrepresented uh, portion of our community that I think uh, we need to really bolster and uh, bring to the fore. So uh, it's happening. Uh, we're excited about it. In addition to all the threads that you see in here from emergency management to uh, clean water service provider, okay. which uh, we have, I think, just the small rivulets coming into the basin, not necessarily the big Winooski. Right. But uh, we're on top of uh, many, many different things. And uh, there are so many people working on so many different committees from South Burlington and uh, from the staff of CCRPC. And we're just, as I say, delighted with uh, Charlie's management. He is also, by the way, on a national board. You're the secretary of, what is it now? Yeah, National Association of Development Organizations. Yeah. Yes. So, so he's uh, garnering uh, attention to uh, Chittenden County, not only uh, in our state, but beyond, and bringing back what he can learn from them. So thank you, Charlie. Anything else? I, I forgot to mess, uh, mention in my activities, because I always forget when I do stuff, but I did attend the CCRPC legislative breakfast. I don't know when it was. Last week? It was two weeks ago. Two yeah. weeks ago. Um, and it was great. And there were a lot of people there. Um, Jesse was there. And was there anyone else from our community? I don't think I so. I think you had four, of, four of your reps. Oh, all the, the reps, yes, for sure, yeah. and, and senators. So it was really um, very helpful as you went through what you saw as the big issues and got feedback from the different communities, both um, on the town level as well as um, the legislative um, levels. And, you know, clearly Chinon County is a pretty diverse county. So it um, can be a challenge. <laughs> but I, I thought it was a, a very um, helpful and informative meeting, and I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks. Just one, one minute on that. I'll just add just for the rest of you that weren't able to be there. We talked quite a bit about uh, kind of the follow-up from S100 and Act 47, mm -hmm. right, which was very, as you, I know you felt, very focused on municipal land use regulations, right? Um, and so... Uh, there was a lot has been a lot of conversation about okay that's fine what about the state's role in regulating land use and and um, so expect this year to be much more around act 250 mm -hmm. um, and also climate resilience connected in with that um, so I think I don't know I'm encouraged that some positive things come out of the session um, but as always stay tuned and participate as needed so and let me know if I can help with any of those things Great. Yeah, thank you very much. Appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Do you have any questions for us other than, you know, a couple more projects? Uh, no, I will leave it at that. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> okay. not, at, not at the time. I guess um, maybe a heads up that we do have, I mentioned the TDM study, but the um, Exit 14 which uh, those of you that have been on the council longer will know. We've had a lot of conversations about mm -hmm. 89 and interchanges. Um, and Exit 14 and redesigning that was mm -hmm. one of the kind of primary things. Um, so we're starting um, kind of to refine that scope in the coming months. So just, just a heads up. Um, hopefully uh, it kind of supports and you know, provides an alternative method to the bridge that you're also building. But we are still looking at how to slow traffic there and you know, help bike, bike and pedestrians get through that interchange easily without impacting traffic congestion. Is that what all the survey teams were working on? I doubt it. Oh. Mm -hmm. I'm not, They've I'm been on Hinesburg Road for at least a week or two. On Hinesburg Road? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That I'm not aware of a transportation Starting project there. beyond me and then over the bridge. <coughs> and 
Yeah, I was. Yeah, I, I saw them out there too. I'm not sure what that was about. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Can I ask a question? You may. So, Charlie, you you sit at like thirty thousand feet over the whole county, right? And 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 you you have visibility to Some a days lot. It feels of, like I'm way down. A lot but, yeah. of things going on, and you also have you know like a sort of microscopic view. What, what do you think are are the challenges to Chittenden County, right? If now out, you know, five, ten years, just off the top of your head. I mean, obviously there there are some obvious ones, right? But yeah, yeah, and those are the ones I kind of got to. You know, the climate, housing, kind of have been top of mind. I think they'll be top of mind for the legislature this year. I mean, probably a couple of years ago, I always said broadband. You know, kind of. Um, but those are the big ones. I think the other thing that um, I'm hearing kind of come up over and over and. Uh, Ellen, you got to mention the, the um, diversity within the county, uh, and a lot of that's around capacity, right? I mean, we have mm -hmm. uh, uh, cities like South Burlington with lots of capacity and, and professionalism, and then we have very small towns with no staff. Mm -hmm. um, and you're seeing this conversation kind of go on around the state of, like, how can we most effectively provide the services that we need to for our citizens? And so... Um, I think that that's an ongoing conversation. I, I wouldn't dare to guess what the answer is, but it seems like maybe it's a conversation that's um, maybe ready to be had. Um, you know, kind of, and you know, I, I didn't grow up in Vermont, but if you look back, you know, to the into, in the 1960s, we had a pretty big statewide conversation about restructuring state, municipal, and county government, and, and figuring out which responsibilities belong where. Right, like towns don't have. Uh, yeah, poor farms anymore. Um, and so, so a lot of those health and human services duties went from municipal to state. Um, so I'm kind of curious to see if there is uh, momentum to kind of start those kinds of conversations up again. Mm -hmm. uh, just because mm -hmm. I, as I talk to my peers and even legislators around the state, it's, you know, or we try to do things like regional dispatch or, um, you know, other regional types of services. And even the CUD is an example. We had to create a new municipality Mm -hmm. to do that, you know, and every time we're trying to get uh, towns want to work together, um, you know, Hinesburg and um, Richmond, we're talking about, could they do a combined police department? And just the the bureaucracy challenges in that, you know, they couldn't, they haven't overcome them yet, right? Um, and that's kind of going on a lot. Um, so anyway, sorry, that was a big can of worms you just opened up, or I just opened up I, on yeah. your question, I apologize, but... But is that uh, just to, to follow up? And that was a great question. Thank you. Um, when you meet with your um, compatriots from other counties or regional planning commissions, do they um, have the have they come to this similar conclusions as you, or are, are their issues yeah. really different? I mean, every regional planning commission kind of struggles with these issues that cross town boundaries. Um, sometimes it's around, you know, um, two or three towns have lost their, you know, they don't have an assessor, um, but it's all, you know, it's kind of a full gamut of services okay. that are uh, issues. So anyway, sorry, I didn't mean to, that was a negative conversation, but um, that was a negative. There. That was just <laughs> what it looks like. Is there regional discussion about um, the unhoused at all? Um, you know, in Chittenden County, we have the uh, homeless Alliance. Um, so I'm, I just kind of awareness of it. We're not directly involved, you know, because it's much more about that direct service provision. Um, and so we try to stay plugged in to see, is there anything we can work on upstream? Um, you know, which I think has led into some of these, you know, zoning regulation questions, um, you know, and just the big picture of, are we providing, uh, you know, are, is our, how much of the issue is a supply, a supply issue? Um, you know, I just read an article that, you know, we're the first or second highest homeless rate in the country. Um, so it's not getting any better right now. Um, a lot of work to do there. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Have a good night. Okay. Item eight then is update to the community of the potential purchase of 1720 and 1730 Spear Street for conservation and affordable housing. Thank you. Um, so 
I'm going to start this conversation, but I do want to also thank and acknowledge that Tom and Janet Bellavance are here in the room with us and um, have been part of crafting this message to the community tonight. And I really appreciate their partnership in um, achieving some big shared goals. Um, so I'm going to provide a very high level overview to the community. We have not a lot of details at this point that we can share, um, but I thought it was important that we come to you and um, present some work that city staff and the Bell Vances are working on. Um, so the Northeast Agricultural Trust, NEAT, um, as um, representatives offered to sell the city uh, 1720 and 1730 Spear Street. Um, the city and NEAT are working together uh, to accomplish a shared set of goals on those two properties um, if, that, if and when that purchase goes through. Uh, the vast majority of these conversations will take place in executive session, as do most land negotiation conversations. Um, however, as a lot of municipal uh, time and resources and potentially dollars in the future will go into this effort, we did want to provide a high-level summary to the community. Um, additionally, NEAT throughout this process has been working with the South Burlington Land Trust. So I want to talk about what our shared goals are in this effort. Uh, so primarily, I think the council's shared goal with the Bellavances is to conserve uh, the majority of the acreage at 1720 and 1730 Spear Street. Um, this would be done through a third party conservation easement that would be executed um, at the time of sale. Um, additionally, there's a shared goal around using some of the acreage, a small portion of the front of the acreage along Spear Street um, to partner with a development partner to build affordable or affordable homes or a very small mixed income neighborhood. Um, so we are currently working with uh, partners in the housing development and conservation sector in Vermont to think about how we bring the highest and best value project forward um, in partnership to the council um, and the community. So we don't know a lot of the specifics yet, and that's purely because it's an active negotiation and we are bringing in these other partners into the conversation to understand what their uh, values might be to partner with us. Um, but we are actively working on this between city staff, the council and the Bell Advances, and I uh, believe there is a path forward in 2024. So that's the high level of what I want to share. I, I can't answer a whole lot more questions about that, but I um, appreciate, again, Tom and Janet being here. And if there's anything I've missed in our shared statement, I would welcome you to provide that comment. Um, and otherwise, with that, with that, that's what I want to share. Do either of you want to make a comment or? Okay, great. All right. I don't have any comments, but I'm glad that the public is aware of this now and we hope to keep moving forward. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, you may. I don't know if we can answer them, but you can ask away. Would you come up to the mic, please? Is the bright button on? Um, push the button in the middle. It says push of the mic, the mic base, or is it different than ours? Oh, it might be a different one. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay, Sandy Dooley's East Terrace. I, I was trying to understand how this interacts with our land development regulations because I would assume this is subject to the conservation PUD reg regulations. So I'm assuming that at least 70% of the land would be conserved because that's the minimum under the conservation PUD. And I heard you say a majority and 70% is more. So I'd be interested um, in whether 70% is the number. Um, and I'm also interested in um, the whatever isn't, 70 is a minimum in the regulation, um, whatever isn't to be conserved, um, is the city proposing to buy that as well? And um, is the land development regulation that would require the land that's not um, conserved to be developed at R4 
does that apply? Uh, that's a, a minimum um, required development. And I've read stuff in the South Burlington Land Trust minutes that talks about um, dividing the property up into different parcels. And what concerns me is, um, well, first of all, I didn't think that was the intent under interim zoning of the um, conservation PUD, but I would certainly not want the property divided up such that you have one big parcel that's um, for conservation and a bunch of little ones that are not subject to the PUD because they're under four acres, and therefore we really lose an opportunity to get more housing than we would if it's a conservation PUD. So I'm trying to understand how this fits with our land development regulations and our desire in the conservation PUD to provide both housing and uh, preserve open space. So I guess I think uh, for the community to have some sense of how this is going to work, we need more information than you have shared. Okay. Yes, you may. Um, Thank you, Sandy. Um, so absolutely, it is the city's intent and the property owner's intent to follow our own land development regulations. Um, it is very likely that that will be done through a conservation PUD. Um, and I'm sorry that we don't have specifics now. We erred on the side of coming to the community very early in this process to be very transparent and public about the conversations we were having. And quite frankly, we don't know the, those details yet because we're trying to bring in um, development partners, conservation partners, in partnership with the Bell Vances and the city um, to bring the highest and best value project to the community. So when we have more answers, I'm sure we will come to you and share them. Sure. Just Sandy, just for um, Act 42 will require along where I think the housing is contemplated five units per acre. So that's going to be, a, 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 you know, that will kind of set the foundation. Okay. I, I just want to say that according to the land trust minutes, meetings have been taking place on this since January. Doesn't seem to be super early in terms of the discussions about what between city staff and and the Balavances and South Burlington Land Trust Planning. So this has been going on for almost a year. Not as early as I would have liked. Okay. Um, J Janet, would you like to respond? Can you Would you so, come to the mic, though, please? And that's really for the benefit of those online who can't hear if, if folks aren't at the mic. Janet Bellavance. Um, yes, that we've had some initial talks, but really there's been a period of about eight or nine months when we were waiting for an appraisal where nothing was really happening. So um, even though it got started, it was just kind of a start with an initial concept and then nothing... It's been really a lot of wait time. And so it's just started up again. So that's why we're having this conversation. Mike, did you have a comment or a question? Yes, please. Good evening. Uh, I share uh, some, probably all, of Sandy's concerns. Uh, I'm wondering why uh, this uh, conversation or sharing of the discussion of the city's potential acquisition of this property uh, wasn't put out there sooner. Uh, <clears throat> I'm actually wondering when the kind of reassurance that a buyer needs uh, to have that uh, uh, I mean, it's pretty rare when you see somebody acquire a property for a million three that they don't intend to use. So the reassurances that uh, might have been sought over the intentions of the city to be there, uh, to partner, to acquire the property, I don't know how early those were provided. Uh, they may have been provided during a due diligence period before the property was acquired or very soon after the property was acquired. 
but uh, I'm just going to say it's a it's pretty rare when somebody goes out and acquires a property that they don't need personally without having an idea of what the outcome of the acquisition of that property is going to be. Uh, I am wondering uh, why the city's mindset here would not be to maximize the amount of housing that would be possible <clears throat> on this site, which is perfectly located for housing, which is located between two existing developments where curb cuts uh, were actually uh, required so that uh, the infill development that was likely to occur here uh, could be accessed uh, when that development did occur. We are in the middle of an acute housing shortage. It is basically a supply problem. We need uh, new housing at all price levels and price points. Uh, the Longs uh, had submitted a proposal for 49 units, and uh, the City Council uh, declined to uh, support that application, and it was withdrawn, and the Longs uh, then de decided to uh, put the property on the market. But I would hope that the City would uh, pursue a path uh, where the maximum number of homes that could be permitted on this property would be permitted. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, for the record, Dan Albrecht, uh, Proctor Avenue. A uh, couple things. First, just a larger point about the use of the conservation fund. Um, it. A couple things. One. First of all, if. There was a time, and Paul Conner is more familiar with this, but there was a time when conservation funds were more at play because zoning had not evolved and towns had not done the work to identify wetlands or habitat blocks in the case of South Burlington, or now we have river corridors, quite a few different things. And so, you know, when it, conservation funds, I don't know when they've been around since Paul, 20, 30 years now, um, Vermont. So it's just sort of weird to spend city tax resources to acquire property, the bulk of which can't be developed anyway. You know, the zoning takes care of that. Um, second, the city has acquired several other parcels over the years and done little or nothing to make them available to the public, even though they're paid for all with public tax dollars. And that includes not just parking, but wayfinding signage, uh, trails, clear delineation of where you can walk or where you can't, things like that. Um, and the Underwood slash Hubbard Park parcel is uh, it's a great parcel, but I've been very disappointed that of the lack of uh, public access and public promotion of that use that was bought by it for all of us. Um, third, in line with the city plan, mm -hmm. I'm disappointed that the city is spending efforts to potentially buy a property that doesn't need to be bought, and yet where all the growth is planned for, uh, namely the Shelburne Road corridor, we still see no efforts by the city to buy open space on the west side of Shelburne Road or create a park or a community center. We had a chance with the Hannaford's property, but I guess, of course, that has to go to the Tesla folks. Um, so... When I look at this, uh, yeah, I mean, if the city wants to get in the business of land development, I guess it can do that. It's a tricky thing. Most municipalities don't want to get into the business of buying a parcel. and then, But it hypothetically could be done. You put it out there as an RFP, and we're saying we're looking for nonprofit developers, and here's the boundaries, here's the constraints on the property. Um, I wish you could have more units. Uh, it's still located relatively close to employment on Shelburne Road Corridor. There's no bus lines there yet, but, um, you know, the density is the best weapon against climate change. The back two-thirds of the parcel that is the ecological value would still be protected. 
It would still have been under, protected under the Long's proposal as well. I wish there could be more density, but the city felt the need to take away the density calculation from that acreage to punish people, even though we could have put more apartments. But by creating the habitat blocks and saying that doesn't count towards the density calculation, you've removed the potential for more units and more density, which is the best weapon against climate change. It's got water, it's got sewer, it's close to employment. So um, I just keep those things in mind as you think about whether or not to go with this way, but it's it's a pretty tricky thing because I could see many other people going, well, is the city gonna buy my parcel? I've been trying to sell it for years, you know? And I'd be back a year from now saying, okay, what's your plan? Got more and more apartments on Shelburne Road. What's your plan? Where's the services? Where's the equity? So that's about it. Thanks. Thank you. Any others? And not on line, right? Did Michelle Van Turk have it? Michelle Von Turkovich, you have your um, light on, which typically means you want to say something. Is that accurate? No? Okay. Well, then we will move on to item nine, which is consider the charter change language to expand the number of school board members to seven and set a public hearing date at special meetings on January 22nd, 2024 at 645, and again on January 29th, 2024 at 630 p.m. And Colin McNeil, our city attorney, is going to take us through the, the language. I do also oh, just want to note that are. Kate Bailey, the chair of the school board, is online, and Tim Warren, a school board member, is also here in the audience. And I think that's everyone, so that they okay. are here as well. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Um, so we have, based on the recommendation of the of the charter committee that that you convened, and um, and your recommendation to us to to work on this to get it on the the March ballot, uh, we've worked with the school district uh, to come up with some language to to amend the the city charter uh, to increase the number of school board members from five to seven. Uh, currently, right now, the the number of school board members is set. Um, partially by the charter, but also by state statute. So we're consistent with other municipalities or other school districts in the state. Um, so we would need to amend the charter to have it be specific as to how many school board members there are. Um, and working with the with the school district, we, we figured that there was only uh, minor amendments, essentially minor amendments that need to be made. Uh, one is some, some very small edits to an existing section and one is to add a section um, to the charter that is similar to the section in the charter that relates to city councilor members. Um, so we have included that in the memo that is before you um, as, a, as a proposal to, to amend the charter. Um, in order to, to make a charter change, you have to have, um, you have to set out notice and you have to have two public hearings before it can be considered by the voters. Um, so we've suggested some uh, dates for you to do that. They're, they're coming right up. Um, and uh, we've also made a recommendation for a motion for you to make uh, that will allow us to comply with the statutory requirements and, and set this process in motion. Okay. Are there questions or thoughts? Yes, Tim. I don't see an example of the ballot language here. Is that yes. not ready yet? or uh, We have not put together the exact okay. ballot language okay. yet. Okay. Will it be ready by the first public hearing or the second public uh, hearing? Yes, we can make it ready for the first public okay. hearing. Thank you. But you did lay out the election process. And yep. Well, what, what you have in your memo is the, uh, what the proposal for the new charter language would be. Which is different than the language that goes before the voters. Um, but this would be, obviously, the, the proposed edits to the charter would be before the voters. So this, this language, if you were to support it, would be the language that would be before the, the voters. Larry, did you have a question? So, I, uh, Colin, I noticed that the, you're suggesting the first public hearing is the 22nd. Correct. Uh, is that the, the night of our steering committee? Can can both happen? So we intentionally did it that way, one, to meet the notice requirements for the public hearing, because require, the statute requires 30 days notice, but mm -hmm. because this is a school-related charter change, we want to provide the school board an opportunity to participate in your discussion as well. Great. 
Okay, we have Kate and Tim here. Do either of them want to make a comment? Tim, are you in? You can both, <laughs> if you'd like to come up, Tim. You certainly are welcomed. Uh, hi, Tim Warren, school board member. I just wanted to say uh, the board has discussed this. We feel that more representation on the board would certainly be helpful for the community. Um, and there is a significant amount of work that the board does. And uh, we would certainly welcome more people participating simply to help with committees. And we have a lot of issues, a lot of lot of work going on. So this is something we, we really hope passes and strongly uh, support. So thank you. Great. Thank you. Has, has the board taken a, a vote? Did the board take a, an actual vote yes, to support it? We did. So we, yes, we did pass a motion to support this. Yes. Uh, you know, was it unanimous? It was unanimous. Yes, Thanks. it was. Thank you. And Kate, do you want to add anything, Kate Bailey? Uh, thanks for the opportunity. I, I second what Tim said. I think he summarized our meeting on the sixth, uh, where we made the motion to support the ballot language uh, or the charter change potential future ballot language. So. Okay. What Tim said. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, other comments? Yes. I want to make very clear I'm not at this moment representing the Charter Committee or the school board, but Will when you it came to your which, name and where you oh, live oh, just for the me. public. Wendell Thank Holman, you. 69 Joy Drive, F7, South Burlington. I'm sorry that it wasn't taken one step more and moved to eight members because I think it's been difficult for city governing bodies to work within the open meeting law. And from long experience, eight makes it so much easier than a quorum. People are social animals. I'm certainly no different. And it is only normal to want to talk to colleagues before board meetings, but less than a quorum. And with eight, a quorum is four. So if I, I as a school board member, I could be in that conversation and three of my colleagues, and by that time I had no human need to talk to more. So it was very easy to deal with the open meeting law. And that's just a comment that I'll make every time this comes up. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? Discussion by the council? We were very supportive. Yeah. Already. Yeah. So, so quick question before you warn or before you make this motion. Is a quorum of you available on the 29th? That would be a special meeting date, i.e. the fifth council mm -hmm. meeting in January. Oh. <laughs> just want to make sure. Let me look. The 29th? Oh, no, it's December. Monday. Whoops. Um, it's January. Who's going anywhere? I already have it on my uh, calendar. Didn't we already, um, didn't you already ask us that? Yeah, you sent us an email. You sent us an email. Some, oh, there's two special meetings on the 29th? Oh. No. <laughs> oh, okay. I already had it on the calendar. Well, I've already got it on the calendar, so we can just add another item, huh? Okay. I think that you will not be here, right? Yeah, on the 29th. Okay. We'll, we'll send some warm breezes up this way. Okay. We don't need any more warm breezes. Yeah, that's true. We need some snow. That's what we really need. Okay. All right, so I would entertain a motion to set those public hearings. So moved. Can, can you actually? Oh, you want me to read the motion? Yeah, if, if you wouldn't mind reading the motion that's in the in the memo. Oh, I have a motion to read here. It's a little yes. bit lengthy, but if would you, could you like read it, me appreciate. to read the long mm -hmm. motion now? <laughs> yep. Okay. Uh, I move that the city council moves forward for the public's consideration the proposed amendment to the South Burlington City Charter sets public hearings to consider the proposed amendment for January 22nd, 2024 and January 29th, 2024, and directs the city administration to comply with the notice and other recommendations of 17 VS 
2645 and resolves that after the public hearings and any revisions of the language, the City Council may take a vote that the proposed amendment be placed on the ballot of the annual City meeting to be held on March 5th, 2024. Second. Any discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 So it passes unanimously. Okay. They should start advertising now <laughs> for the two Oops. positions. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah. All right. So we move on to item 10, which is further consideration of, of a proposed residential rental ordinance um, information on staffing and space planning. And our purpose is to provide direction to the staff in anticipation of a future first reading. And so Steve Locke will... Take us through. And good evening. Colin and I have been working to update the ordinance based upon our conversation last month. And so we think we have resolved uh, the outstanding uh, conversation topics that we had talked uh, con conversed about that you were looking for us to change. So those include those are outlined in the memo, but includes uh, increasing or charging a rate of twenty five dollars per unit for the permanently affordable units. Um, increases the owner the rental registration fee for non-owner occupied units to fifteen hundred dollars annually. Um, it allows existing non-owner occupied units to be sh used as short-term rentals through April 1 of 2028, basically four years. Uh, removes the exemption for congregate care facilities um, and updates the or clarifies the noise ordinance. And in a version that was sent to you via email this afternoon, added um, some language that I missed. I missed part of the conversation in my notes that we had added exempts um, home share or if you're renting out a, a room in your home, it exempts you from the inspection and having to register. Mm -hmm. So that is in the draft ordinances before you. I believe that captures most of what we talked about. Um, and then obviously the next step would be your approval to go to a public hearing on that in the future, at a future meeting. Okay. Thank you. Further, is there any discussion or comments yeah, just by council members? Sure, we'll start with. <laughs> so. Under definitions? Yeah, it says in rental unit rented to the transient traveling or vacation public for a period of fewer than 30 consecutive days and for more than 14 per days per calendar year. Does that mean there's that's 14 occurrences per calendar year? Or, or are you saying that it's between 14 and 30 days that it's th 14 and 29 days that it's actually rented out? If you could just state for me what you think it's supposed to mean. Absolutely. So first of all, I, I believe we took this right from the state statute um, relating to short-term rentals. But what it means is that um, it can't be rented for more than 14 days a calendar year and be considered a short without registering. Uh, so if, if, it, uh, if a unit is rented for under 14 days, uh, it's not considered a short-term rental. It does not need to register under the ordinance. That's, just, that's consistent with the statute. Uh, if, it's, if it's rented for more than 14 days, uh, it needs to be, it's considered a short-term rental and must uh, register as a short-term rental with the city. Um, and the difference between the 14 days and the 30 days is that, um, well, once you hit that 14 day thresh threshold, then um, any rental, if you're renting for under 30 days, if you're renting for over 30 days, you're a long-term rental. If you're renting for under 30, if you have a period of renters for under 30 days, you are a short-term rental. Okay, so what you're saying is if, if the if each rental is less than thirty consecutive days, no, no, no. yes. Well, in a way, if each rental is under under thirty days, you're a short term rental. Right, but if but the, but if you if, only do if, if you only rent out seven days in one year, you're not a short term rental. But if you had just fourteen days of rental total for the year, you wouldn't be considered correct a, a short term rental. Okay, yeah. STR, I got it. Now I understand. Okay, <laughs> it's just a little. And then the other question was. Uh, Sorry for. Oh yeah, in in terms of, of documenting the addresses, uh, supplying a license and registration, um, are you requiring that that the owner's address on their license or other documentation is the same as the as the as the owner occupied unit or of the? 
you know, I think we have, we've allowed some discretion in there. Okay. Um, so I think a driver's license is one of the criteria because not everyone is going to have a driver's license. So it has to be, you have to establish proof that that is your primary residence or, or, um, or your, your rental is a, is a your primary residence. Is the, is the identification solely for identification purposes? Is that what it is? Oh. Whether or not it's owner occupied. Oh, okay. So then that ID should indicate that their address on that item is equal to the, the home that's owner occupied. I mean, it, I mean, it can if it if it doesn't, and there's other supporting documentation. Yep. I think the building the the okay. building inspector has some leeway to accept yeah. that other identification. Say, for instance, you own a home, but your address is still your parents' house where you grew up. Okay. On your license, I think that would be fine as long as you could establish that that is your primary residence in another okay. way. Um, I, I had a general question that maybe you know the answer. Maybe we've talked about this before, but um, you, I, you know the. Uh, the, the rooms tax that gets remitted to the state, probably by Airbnb and, and Verbo, I'm supposing, right? Do we know if that goes in lump sum to the Vermont Tax Department, or does it include addresses and owners of those units as well? Do do we know? I don't know. No. We, My understanding is that it includes at a minimum the zip code because they need to know okay. how to apply the local options tax. Other right. than that, um, the tax department holds that tax data very close right but I mean so I'm just asking is there opportunity there to ask for the address not the amount but the address if they do get the address and an amount if we just had the address then we could boost our our, our listing of, of the of, of who actually is renting out it's just just a, a tan, tangential idea that's all and my understanding is that Airbnb has a contract with the state yeah. to to submit those taxes and but they're potentially the only one uh, so uh, all others are responsible individually for, for signing up and paying those oh, taxes okay. and having a tax account. So like Verbo doesn't do that? I don't believe so. No, Verbo does. Oh, they do? Because we use them, yeah. Oh, okay. But we don't use them anymore, so we have to submit them, and you need to submit them on a monthly basis. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But I don't recall, well, we're just renting one place, so they have the address. So when you do submit that, you submit the address of the rental as well? Um, is that a requirement? Yeah, my sister-in-law does it. I, okay. <laughs> I, don't, I can't remember okay. what the form looks like, but they okay. they get enough information in the tax department to, to be satisfied that we're paying the um, state tax. So. All right. The other question I had was, and there's no page, so in the um, definition of the registration fees, right, in C and D, they're both short-term reg reg rental registration fees. One's one fifty, one's fifteen hundred dollars. So the fifteen hundred is for currently existing STRs, N non owner occupied. Non? Does it say that? Yeah. So the somewhere. the thought was if you run an owner occupied short-term rental, and this is my my um, what I thought I understood you to agree on. If I had an owner-occupied short-term rental, so I live there, but I rent a bedroom out or I have an ADU, yeah. that you wanted that to be at the normal $150, at the normal fee, normal registration fee. But if you had a non-owner-occupied short-term rental, right. you wanted to charge the higher fee. Okay. Do, do we need to add the fact that it's owner-occupied on C, or am I missing something here? Where it... uh, so I added it in one place. I may have missed it in another place. Okay. So it's quite possible. You know, I think that would help if it was non-owner was added to pretty much every time you had non-owner uh, occupied. I think there's a, there, it reads with a little confusion because you have to keep going back to definitions to see that. Uh, that, I think, was all I... Can I ask a quick question? You certainly may. Um, a couple of emails from uh, folks today about the four-year period of phasing out, and I really don't know where that number, where that time frame came from. Is there a rationale for that? Um, Could you repeat that? The four-year four year phasing out the. Yeah, I was going to speak to that as well. I'm happy to. Yeah. So right. Um, so we had a bunch of folks come before us that had really valid. Um, concerns about short-term rentals that were adjacent to their homes that seemed to be largely owned by out-of-state residents and that were not monitored and controlled that well so that it was 
disrupting the quality of life. Conversely, we had some folks come before us that live in the community that presently have one or two non-owner-occupied rentals nearby, and they said, look, um, we rely on this to feed our family, um, and if you take this away from us, you know, it's going to cause us severe economic hardship. And in my mind, that four years was meant to balance those two concerns. How do we address the valid concerns of the neighbors who want to see the short-term rentals next to them that are owned by the out-of-state folks gone? And how do we not cause severe economic hardship to our residents? So that, that, that's, that's where they came up with. And we, we, ha we played around with other potential solutions, which um, we learned may have some legal you know, infirmities to them. So they, they did, just didn't, they didn't pan out. Um, that's where that came to. Well, while I have the floor, can I, can I talk about one other thing? And, Let right, me just, does yeah, that no, yeah, please, address right, no, you? That, that's I mean, fine. I, it you. was sort of picked out of like, no, oh, that seems like a good enough yeah. time to for make, local, for owner. local people to yeah. make some other economic um, decisions and planning. Sure, makes sense. I don't know Thank if you. it's perfect, but that's what we picked. So just one, I just want to raise again, um, last time I made the suggestion, but I just want to raise it again, maybe just a little more articulately. What we don't have right now is a moratorium. So until this finally passes, there, I think are folks out there, or could be folks out there continuing to, you know, buy up properties and places we may not want them to do short-term rentals. I really urge us to build a moratorium into this, leg into this ordinance right now by... Um, changing in the definition of existing short-term rental instead of saying prior to the effective date, you know, prior to today, so that folks know out there in the public that, you know, the short-term rentals are not something that we can continue to create mm -hmm. in, in the city as of today. Would you be amenable to upon passage? Because well, no, but that's... implementation, well... It's it right gonna, now says prior to the effective date. We have two hearings, yeah. and then we have to um, uh, make the final decision, which yeah. will I, I would take be in a favor month or two. Of a moratorium. But the um, implementation really doesn't happen for a year. I think it's April first or April thirty first or something, twenty twenty four. But um, was it April twenty four or twenty five? I thought we gave the twenty. April 24 was, it was because our the thought process is between two public hearings and getting to you had passage will be sometime in February. And so oh, that was, okay. that was our, that was be our thought. See, I was still in 2023 and I was thinking, oh, we're giving them a year to get ready, we're, but we're not, we're just getting, giving them a couple months. I mean, you have been talking about this for many months. With we that have, date that's true. So I mean, certainly true. upon passage. You change that date if you'd like. Yeah, I, I think certainly upon passage f makes us feel okay. Mm -hmm. Setting a date, I think we said the same thing last time, setting a date prior to the adoption on, on the moratorium, it, it, cons I think, and probably more for Colin than I, is concerning. Is concerning because legally that would be an issue? I, you know, really, I think so. I mean, you're, you're setting a date that's prior to all the public notice taking place. Um, so there's there's a little bit of a concern just from from my point of view about you know due process and making sure that everyone is is well ad, um, adhered and noticed as to when this is going to go into effect and the implications. Okay. Well, you've made your case. Do you, got, do you have any? Does um, Andrew have any takers? <laughs> does anyone agree with him that a moratorium would be a I think I would agree with council as well. I, I, you know, I don't think it's going to slow it down too much because we're just a couple months away. From I mean, we could set it perhaps the date of the first public hearing if that addresses the legal concerns. But it's got to be passed, I think, right? Yeah, not, I think it has to be upon passage. I will say, in my experience, there are lots of regulations where there's an effective date. That's when there's a proposal that's before in order to implement the moratorium. I mean, that's not an uncommon thing to do. LDRs do that. Not uncommon well, to do that. Well, that's true. 
So um, that is the, I mean, that's the way to do a moratorium. It's not, I, I've personally seen that in my professional experience many times. Well, what's the council going to do? Are you convinced by Andrew, or do you want to stick with? <laughs> I, I just wait till we pass it personally. Okay. Yeah. I, I I think people want to wait. I understand yeah. your concern. Okay. I have a couple. Uh, one more question. Okay. Um, so we we received some emails uh, from uh, folks who um, administer affordable housing units, right? Uh -huh. And some of them. Um, have said that they get inspected by BHA. I don't know if that applies here, but HUD, HUD, right? Uh, especially if they're Section Eight. So, and some of them said that there are three organizations that might be inspecting these units. And my only question is, um, if there were one or more inspections happening from other organizations that that parallel the same codes that we were going to follow, would we really want to over inspect like that and? and put an undue burden on the residents of those units that are seeing somebody once or twice a year anyway. And if that's true, then would we want to roll back the cost per affordable unit that we were contemplating anyway? I'm just putting that there for general discussion. I mean, as long as those other inspections cover smoke detectors, and especially if these are new buildings that were built in the last 10 years and they know that they were built to some code, I guess my response would be this: um, two things. One, if they're up, if they're if if we inspect them, they're up to date, no violations, or limited violations. You're only going to see us every five years. I every don't time. every five years. That's the plan. Okay. Um, and then two, we are the authority having jurisdiction. That's a building in our community. We're the only ones that truly can enforce the adopted fire code. Your adopted fire code. And so I would not feel comfortable giving that authority to anybody else. That is, you know, that it's my responsibility. It's just you, you through your uh, actions to ensure our buildings are safe. And if we're going to do this, I, I don't think uh, I don't think every five year inspection for the vast majority of our properties is in, is that too much of a burden. Did, did I miss that in here? That's five years. So what there is an addendum based and I did share it with Andrew because he asked. So we uh, in similar, we basically borrowed uh, the same document or same inspection cycle that happens in Burlington that in, uh, the inspection cycle is based upon the number of violations. So a building most in which same happens in Burlington, most of the buildings that are um, up to code and have no, limited violations on or quickly uh, rectified violations upon inspection or is it every five year cycle? We could never inspect all these buildings every year with just two inspectors. Right. So I think at Burlington, the, the code enforcement officer told me over 80% of their buildings are on a five year cycle. And then some similar to the article you saw in, in Digger about a property on Lower Church Street um, has so many violations that it's there there every year. So uh, we, we, we may have a couple of those. I would, I would almost doubt it. Uh, most of our buildings are in pretty good shape, but this we'll know for sure this way. So does Burlington inspect buildings like uh, Decker Towers? and? Do as far as I see, and I'll say this, as far as I know they do, um, but, but code enforcement was not under my purview in Burlington, so I wouldn't want to get ahead of my skis there. Can I jump in on this? So... Um, this is one of the areas I feel pretty strongly about that um, in Winooski, so Winooski also has a rental registry. Um, there were some, for this very reason, there were some perpetually affordable homes that were not part of our inspection system, and it became a real um, differentiation in housing quality, mm -hmm. and some of our most awful fires and uh, hurt folks came from those parcels. So to create a system where we are saying we want quality, life safety, housing for all, but exempt a certain population of our neighbors from being able to participate in that inspection, I think is really detrimental and against some of our equity values. And just to add one more thing for, um, not from a fire perspective, but I think that there is a, a huge possibility as we stand up this team and they build relationships with the significant landlords in our community, that we could, by policy, have conversations about coordinate, coordinating inspections. So the user ex or the mm -hmm. neighbor experiences something different. They may not know that there's a, you know, a South Burlington inspector and a HUD inspector there at the same time, for mm -hmm. example. Okay. 
but that's not something to ordain. That's a best practice for our, us to implement. Does it make sense to include the appendix in the uh, in, in this work? I, I'm not a fan. I mean, personally, I'm not a fan of putting something like that in a in an ordinance. I would have to come back through this process. That to me is more of an internal policy. Right. Okay. Can you repeat what you asked? Because I didn't hear it. Well, the appendix that. The addendum the that addendum, was outlining right. every five years, yeah, or if you have the, the so many um, yeah. violations, it's sooner. Okay, are there any other questions or concerns about the language that's being presented? Is there anyone um, at home viewing that has wants to make a comment? We got two here. Okay, we got three here. All right. So why don't we start with Ryan and then. Mr. Van Dorkovich, and I don't know your name. Ryan Doyle, Woodside Drive. Um, so we're pretty far into this ordinance, and I think last time there was some discussion of the council of we're doing kind of two things with this one ordinance. One is the uh, short-term rental issue, and the other is making this registry for rental units. Although it seems like a lot of this is actually geared toward the kind of negative situation we have over on Austin Drive, where that we have some very heavy fines that we're putting on the table to try to deal with um, those problem houses in that neighborhood. But some of those could be really detrimental to somebody who is just trying to get up and running. So if uh, I think like in my case where I had a roommate just suddenly leave and I very quickly pivoted to Airbnb, it would be really hard to actually have all of those things you're asking for in the ordinance in place before actually getting somebody in there to help cover that lost rent. Um, while it's pretty easy to set up something on Airbnb, for example, um, you know, like getting notarized things um, to the city and even getting like these account numbers, for example, from Airbnb or approvals from the landlord, uh, that can take a while. So even though like my lease actually says I can use Airbnb in it, I would have to go through a second round of meeting with my landlord and getting their time. And I just think there should be a little more space of wiggle room for that flexibility of housing so that we can try to catch more people and have less low time in there. Uh, I realize that's a very different issue than the issue of a problematic house where an investor is taking up the housing and causing, um, I don't wanna say blight, but deleterious effects in a neighborhood. The other question I have is like Burlington has been doing this for quite a while and they've developed even more um, robust ordinances that fit into place in different places here. They also have lower registration fees. Um, they do have a certain economies of scale to do that. But I was wondering if the city spent any time in negotiation with Burlington to see about the feasibility of actually picking piggybacking onto their system, which has already been built out pretty well and either using the type of um, software infrastructure they have or um, paying into using uh, their staff or something like that to see about doing this much more cost effectively. Because um, again, I see that we're trying to price these um, registrations to a point where it can sustain the program, including building um, additional office space. but. Again, Burlington has fees that are lower, so clearly they're able to do something a little bit differently. So I was wondering how much discussion had occurred there at all, if at all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do you want to comment? I mean, I, I, I always think regionalization of things is probably wonderful, but I look at some of our conversations um, just around the... Um, what do you call it? When dispatch. You, the dispatch and Burlington wasn't really terribly interested, um, even though I think we made a case that it would be cost effective and, uh, and you know, a really good idea. So I don't know if I would support going down that road again with a rental registry. You've got two different fire departments and I don't know. 
We do have Burlington's code enforcement uh, director coming over next in two weeks to talk about uh, the software system that they are using, um, both mainly for permitting, but I believe it's the same software system for registration. Um, and if that works, that may be something we would be, we're, obviously we're looking to modernize our permitting and making the experience for our customers easier to to. To, to register and to pay fees, not just here, but in, around citywide. Um, but I guess I would, I, I share your concern about um, regionalization on this project. Just two comments. Yes. I, th I think the Burlington cost per unit is around 150 right now. Um, and the city clerk can notarize documents, right? Right. Yeah. So. I also, I'm, I'm just curious, Ryan, I thought we had agreed that we included in this, you know, a roommate or um, that you weren't a B and b if you had a, a roommate in your own home. Um, so there was some exception. So I'm not sure, you know, I think you're covered, but. Yeah, just that's for long term. Maybe not uh, advertising on Airbnb for your roommate. We, we just exclude a long term roommate, not short term. Oh, long term, excuse me. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, my name is Frank Von Turkovich, and I'm interested in one aspect of the uh, ordinance that I don't know if it's been considered by the council yet or the uh, anyone who's been working on this. And I can appreciate the um, desire to uh, stop the conversion of existing housing stock into short-term rentals. But is there is there any reason why the city would be opposed to the development of new short-term rental uh, housing product? Um, I don't think that a new uh, purposely built short-term rentals uh, unit would offend any of the um, uh, uh, objectives of this ordinance. And it could, uh, in today's economy, uh, enable uh, non-short-term rental housing units to be developed. So I'm wondering if we're missing an opportunity here by totally closing off the, uh, the the having a policy that restricts complete use of short-term rentals, which I'm not sure is anybody's ultimate desire. I think a lot of people here use short-term rentals. I know that when we've traveled, we've used them and we've enjoyed them and they've been fine. And sometimes they're even the most appropriate way to, to visit a, a community and house a family or house a group or, or a couple or, or an individual. But I am wondering if the ordinance uh, doesn't need to go as far as to say that all uh, short-term rentals, including new ones, uh, should be prohibited. Okay. All right. I don't know if we discussed develop. You're talking about having a development that would build 15 short-term rentals. Is that what you're talking about? That, that could be a possibility, but I also think that someone who was going to build a duplex or a fourplex or a larger project may want a certain number of short-term rental units in that project to make it economically feasible. Okay, so a, a new build. Yes, all new build. In, in uh -huh, my uh -huh. point. Think, Comments on? Yeah, I mean, yeah. part of what I guess is motivating me to be in favor of what we have mm -hmm. now is um, having a hard time drawing the line between a hotel you know, um, which doesn't really belong in a residential neighborhood and a short-term rental. And so um, you can build a hotel. It could have larger units. Um, they can certainly substitute for the amenities that a short-term rental would have, but then you have to build it in areas that are zoned for that type of mm -hmm. business. So part of what's motivating me is to not have that business be in an area zone for residential that doesn't contemplate it. I appreciate that. I, I do think there's a difference between a, a consumer who wants to stay in a hotel versus a consumer who's specifically looking for a uh, Airbnb type experience. So just wondering if the council needs to go as far as to say that no future uh, 
units can be dedicated to uh, short-term rentals, um, especially keeping in mind that it may have an impact on units that could be could contribute to the housing stock of the city. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, my name is Lauren Marino. I'm here on behalf of Cathedral Square. We're a nonprofit housing developer for uh, older adults. And um, I just wanted to speak in support of the rental registry. We think that um, that's going to be beneficial for the community for several reasons that have been discussed. Um, and we encourage you to support the earlier recommendation to exempt permanently affordable housing units from the registration fee altogether. Um, we know that it has been exempted and then was added back at a lower rate of $25, and um, that does add um, burden to our portfolio, even though it seems marginal. Um, and with that, our mission includes keeping rents as affordable as possible in this difficult mm -hmm. cost environment um, where we face rising property taxes, operation costs, staffing shortages. Um, so we ask that you consider uh, um, moving back to the previous version, which exempted that. And similarly, um, we support the recommendation to include congregate care facilities and also ask that you exempt permanently affordable congregate care facilities from the registration fee. And um, I know that this was discussed earlier, but we do request limiting inspections for properties that are already inspected by organizations. Um, some of our properties really do face three or four yearly inspections. Um, from Burlington Housing Authority, which does extend um, throughout the Northwest region, as well as HUD, the Vermont Housing Finance of, uh, Agency, and the State Housing Authority, um, and that our residents do experience that inspection fatigue. So to at least uh, coordinate that with the inspection mm -hmm. schedule that we have would be really appreciated. Thanks. I certainly think we would attempt to coordinate that because it makes sense right. um, for sure. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there any, are there any other comments or thoughts? I just wanted to be sure that we answered Amy Dimitrovitz's concern about the fees. If something has gone wrong, there is a daily charge. Um, she's at the last meeting, she stated that where, um, where there's a multi-unit um, building and then there was some repairs that needed to be made, and she was, I think, concerned about kind of a daily buildup of fees. That's not ringing any bells. I think they're penalties. I apologize. I don't. I don't remember that discussion aspect of the of the discussion. I think that we addressed uh, one request relating to the noise ordinance uh, in long term kind of separating out short-term and long-term uh, rental units from noise viol noise ordinance violations in this particular ordinance. But um, I don't remember the other uh, topic which you are referring to. Okay. Well, I am in favor of it going to a public hearing, and perhaps she will come forward at that time and speak again. Uh, yeah, I was saying the $700 fee was if you were in violation of something, then the f you paid the fee and you had to make the corrections. I would have to works? watch. I'd have to watch the tape in order to okay. to understand. I don't. I have no recollection of it, and it's not in my notes. So. Okay. All right. Any other thoughts? Yeah, it's here. A civil penalty of up to eight hundred dollars per day for each day that such violation continues. So that that is, is that long term or that's short term. That's just short term. term. Yeah. So let me find the long term. Yeah, I didn't compare it to the previous one, which I okay. just wanted to get a quick nod of the head, but I guess. Ryan, you have another comment? Ryan Doyle again. Um, so one of the things I, I try to look for with the uh, 
some of the streets people complained about was if I could figure out which house was actually on Airbnb. Um, and I couldn't. And I looked at the grand list and I really couldn't tell also. And so I was wondering if when we talk about the existing homes that are going to be charged $1,500 a year that are not owner or tenant occupied, um, if perhaps there's a condition on their registration that because they're really commercial properties, they should be paying commercial taxes. And so if they've been billed as residential tax properties that in order to be registered, they would have to come up with the difference of tax they haven't been paying. Um, is that difference making sense? I think that that does happen now as people file their income taxes with rentals in their homes. It goes through the uh, non-homestead process at the tax department, and we are informed of that. So you I think what you're suggesting exists now. So any of those homes that are on like Austin Road are being taxed at the commercial rate, not the residential rate. I don't know the specifics of every property on Austin Road. <laughs> but if they're non-owner occupied, if they're a non-homestead, then they're taxed at the non-homestead versus the homestead rate. Which is not commercial. Which is not commercial. Commercial is a little bit lower, isn't it? Yeah. I, I don't know that there's a commercial tax rate. Well, I was saying was commercial instead of non-homestead. Non that's the oh, sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you think that that's, they're all. If they're not their primary residence, they would be, it'd be, they'd be lying on their tax when they fill out their form if they were paying the homestead cool. tax rate. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Well, they, they have to file a homestead tax form in order form, to be right. eligible to right. be considered for homestead, right? Yeah. And if you're late, if you're late and you don't get it. We've heard those <laughs> concerns before. Andrew. Yeah, I'm just wondering, um, Chief, could you maybe just describe a, a few minutes the schedule that you propose, which we conversed a, a few times about? I know um, Mr. Bold proposed some very um, sensible, um, had some suggestions about sampling. I know you were going a, a different route, which sounds, you know, appropriate to me, but just for the public and sure. for the council, just to understand that. And, and understand we took this... Uh, when I when I first went to Burlington, the we, working with code enforcement, they, they were working to come up with a cycle in order to clarify how they were going to do their inspections, and so we mirrored ours very similar to off the off theirs. But basically, at a high level, um, if you if you have a inspect if we inspect the property and it's it's found to have um, no violations, then you're in, issued a five year certificate of of compliance. So you, we, we don't come back for five years unless there is a complaint. If we inspect it and it's had five or less and they're corrected within 30 days, the building receives a four-year inspection cycle. And then basically the, the greater violations, the, the, the less the time frame to a point where we're there every year. So again, like, as I said previously, uh, talking with Burlington's code enforcement uh, director, the vast majority of their properties receive a five-year certificate of, of compliance. And when I was in an apartment in Burlington in a rather large setting, um, they came in and did the whole complex in one, one or two days. So your landlord lets you know, you know, today's the day or this week is the, the week we're going to be testing the fire alarm. We're going to be in your units. Um, and then again, if most of these larger units have property management, they make sure everything is corrected in advance. The fire department's in and out a few in a day or two. Um, and then because of that, we're back there five years. So that raises a question for me. Um, I have a friend who lives in an apartment um, in South Burlington with an HOA. And I don't know, a couple weeks ago, they had all the fire alarms were tested and yeah. and and so i'm just but it was the hoa or the rental group who was doing that and then they did stuff for the elevators and it was you know all organized if that's the case do in, under this scenario 
would you also have to go in and do the fire alarms? So we go in and make sure, all we do is make sure the fire alarm has their certificate issued by the state saying that it's been inspected by a technically qualified person. Okay. So we don't. What we go in and make sure is that the sticker is on the fire alarm and sticker is on the sprinkler system. So okay. they're required. And we typically will work with the HOA or the property manager to coordinate those. So we're not trying to coordinate with 32 tenants. We're coordinating with one, okay. one person. So those people really wouldn't see a difference? Not really. Are, are you intending on inspecting or, or looking for inspection tags on, um, on heating systems as well? Oil or gas? So on, on, yes, to make sure that they have been inspected and checked. Yes. And is that it? Is that the ordinance that, that they need to be inspected? No, that years? really comes in a variety of, and Terry is on, I think Terry is on, but uh, they, they basically have an inspection checklist, uh, not, again, not included here in the ordinance, that outlines everything within uh, occupancy that, they, that at a high level needs to be checked. And that would include, like, uh, you know, a, a probe reading of the gases and the exhaust from a combustion. So again, we don't check that. We make sure that that has been checked. Oh, okay. Right. So again, we 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 make sure someone else, okay, who is technically right. qualified, has inspected and validated that with typically an inspection sticker. Okay. It's Matt, did you want to comment on that? I mean, that's up your alley, huh? Or was, I guess, not maybe this moment. But. What the last comment was exactly correct. Matt Cota, for the record. Um, any commercial building is governed by the Vermont uh, Fire Building and Fire Safety Code, which requires an inspection of any combustion heating appliance every three years with the sticker and the tag by a certified oil or gas tech. Okay, thank So that's you. commercial buildings only, not single family. Thank you. So I'm pretty sure Burlington requires two years. But I don't know where they, and and that's why I was being purposefully vague, and I was hoping Terry was going to bail me out. I didn't know what the cycle was. <laughs> I I knew it required a sticker. Well, I didn't know. I did not know the cycle. And Terry, what's the Terry cycle? Terry has his little green light on. Can you <laughs> clarify, Terry? He's having audio problems. Okay. But I'm sure Matt had it right at three years. Okay. It's in the code, so. Great. All right. Any other comments, questions, thoughts? Okay. So do we have a motion to? So I, I think technically we need to bring it back to you for a first reading. Oh, that's right. Okay. And then you can set a public hearing date. Yeah. Right, we on. haven't really changed anything, but you had given us a few <laughs> more things. It'll be a very short agenda. <laughs> One last question. Does yeah. Do Burlington and Winooski talk to each other, the, each of the code enforcement offices, rental registries? Do they? Yes. Because you have, uh, you know, landlords that span many, many towns, right, and cities. So, okay. And those are constructive conversations. Yeah, I mean, I would say just in my experience, just as the chiefs talk to each other, the managers right. talk to each other, they share best practice, they share okay. information. There's a lot. There's actually a fair amount of work that's done between those two around the hoarding task, Chinning County Hoarding Task Force as well. So that's often an uh, issue that is rises to the top of lists in these kinds of inspections. Okay. All right. Thanks. Okay. Well, we'll see y'all again on the uh, 22nd. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Thank, Thank you, you for this so hard work. The no, before the 22nd, right? It'll be the... Fifth? We have five meetings. In Second, I know. We will see you a lot. Okay. <laughs> All right. So now we're down to, what time is it? Okay. Um, item 11, which is the FY25 budget. And we're all pretty familiar with that, uh, having spent four hours on Friday going through that. But um, we made some changes that did not show up in the article by the um, other paper. So for those of you that read that and had a heart attack or close to one, I hope you didn't really have a heart attack, but you, you, your, um, I don't know, your heart started to race a little bit. We have some good news tonight. <laughs> so um, Martha Maha, May, 
much are. And um, Jesse Baker will be kind of taking us through that. So I'll let Martha talk you through the numbers, but um, just a reminder, if folks are uh, watching remotely um, or on your tablets in the audience, all of this information is at the city's website. Click on the FY25 link right on the main page, and it will go to the finance page where all of the documents Martha is about to talk about are posted. Okay. So I'm just giving you a summary of uh, last Friday's meeting. What we understand was what you proposed and how it is reflected in the budget as uh, proposed and the changes. So during the last Friday's meeting, uh, the three big things that we took away were that uh, the climate action projects would be funded with ARPA fund. The staffing would be funded with general fund and the contribution to affordable housing would be reduced to 75,000. So those changes made to the budget resulted in a, a budget increase or, or tax rate increase of 5.82% or 0 0.0286 cents on top of FY24 budget. And one other edit that has been made to the updated uh, proposed budget is that the curve and sidewalk proposed amount, which was $40,000, is now reduced to $30,000. And the bike pad budget paving has been increased by 10. So it's just a reallocation of funding uh, between the two budget lines. And that is to consider the budget request that came from the bike pad committee late into the budget. So in the memo, or in just the uh, updated uh, summary that I emailed to the council earlier on, I also updated the ARPA funding, what is being allocated to that, and what the balance would be with the uh, proposed funding allocations. Also in here, and what was not uh, discussed or council did not make a decision on what the three items that are currently included in the FY25 budget. And it, it is to, up to the council to decide whether to fund those with ARPA fund or surplus funding. And those include Market Street, Heinsberg Road signals, and bike uh, and park master plan, and also the uh, the grand march for the Heinz Park Road share use path. Those are included in that memo, and uh, those are to be discussed with the council and make decisions on. The council actually also had a discussion to fund the signal work on the Dorset Street Hinesburg Road with surplus. That is also included in there. And I have also included a summary of what uh, the surplus funds would be with that if it is funded out, if, if the fund balance located to fund that project. I think that in the summary of the last Friday's discussion. Okay. Yes. Martha, I just wanted to ask you, is the open space master plan included in the general fund budget? Uh, no, that's not open uh, open space. That's just park master plan. Park master plan. Master right. plan. Okay, because it was discussed on Friday um, as something um, that would be in the work plan, um, I believe, of public works. So I was just curious where that was located. So uh, from conversations staff has had with the committees, I, I believe this has been with the committees, um, The I, so the parks master plan is what you all have prioritized to date. And the thinking it was, is that we do that one this coming year and then finalize the open space fund or open space master, master plan, plan the following year. Okay. Because that we're concerned if we run them concurrently, it's going to be a challenging communications public engagement process okay. um, and that the uh, parks master plan is almost a, a sub um, 
or t a subset of the open space master plan. Okay. Okay. Did you have a question? Not yet. Oh, not yet. Okay. <laughs> Andrew does. Thank you, Martha. Thank you, Jesse, for the um, revised budget. I just have two comments, really. Please not, but please, we shouldn't reduce the sidewalk budget by 10000 But We need all the money to fix our sidewalks that we can. I don't think that was part of the request from Bike Ped. So where did we think that. we were getting that $10,000? I think originally you had wanted to take it out of paving, but then yeah. you wouldn't have enough for Dorset or Street. Or just increase 10000 I don't know. I we shouldn't reduce the sidewalk budget, I guess, is I, I personally would be very uncomfortable with that. Um, the thinking on that is that there is a CIP project for all the sidewalks, and that is a 60000 already in the CIP budget. But that's just for a, an assessment, uh, not correct. for repair. And the sidewalks desperately need repair. Correct. I mean, you can add it back in. Add it. I so would like you to. Want to. Do you want to propose taking that ten thousand dollars from the surplus? Sure. You can also just add it back into, into the, the budget fund expense budget. Okay. So the the thirty thousand or forty thousand is just a line in the general fund yeah. operating budget. Uh -huh. So you can make that line thirty thousand or forty thousand. No. Nope. That won't change the tax rate. Yeah, we'll change it a hundredth of a... <laughs> which tells us. No. Yeah, right. So what while, while she's doing it, the second comment, um, and then um, I think I'm, I'm good with this, is I, I'm okay with the signal coming out of surplus for now, but I got to tell you, it makes me uncomfortable. I just don't understand why. It feels to me like it's a BAU item. It should be funded by right-sized traffic impact fees or other fees for development, particularly in city center. We would not have needed that light, but for the city center development. Mm -hmm. It just feels to me inappropriate to fund it the way we're funding it. And so I'd love to have us take a look at that. Are we right-sizing our traffic impact fees to fund all the traffic infrastructure we think we will need? And is there a way, I think it was alluded to on Friday, to recoup this 350 out of future traffic impact fees. Well, is it? It's part of the tip district. Is it tip eligible? Okay. Why don't we let? Sorry. No. It is not tip. Well, we've already incurred all the debt we're going to incur for the tip, and um, so there are impact fees in the signal project. Two hundred thousand dollars of impact right. fees. What we talked, what staff talked about since that conversation is we can get an opinion from our impact fee consultant about how we can maximize that impact. We cannot pay for the, it is, and Paul, correct me if I'm wrong here, we can't um, totally fund it with impact fees because it's not needed now. So the impact fee can only cover the added use above a stop sign. But we're doing this as much for safety versus and the kids crossing the street. It will be stuff. needed in the future, which is why I we understand that. Oh, I think it's needed now. <laughs> well, but it doesn't meet the. Does it? Um, no, it meets it. It will meet the warrant as it's fully built out, which but it is doesn't why right at the moment. How do we? How can we say that it doesn't meet it? That it meets the need now. Hi, folks. Paul Connor, Director of Planning and Zoning. So under impact fees can only be used for the incremental volume that the intersection handles. So if a stop sign can handle a thousand cars an hour and a and, and hundred pedestrians and a uh, traffic signal can handle 1,500 cars an hour and 200 pedestrians or 500 pedestrians. It's only the difference between the first and the second that can be charged to impact fees, even if the cost is a brand new cost because there's only a certain amount of new traffic, however you want to define traffic, that is um, enabled by it. It's not going from zero. It's going from whatever gets through is can get through there now to what can get there to with, with a new signal, which is tricky because it's not. It's like a little percentage. Right. So it's not a service level question? Like, because it's F there. At, right, at, but at it's still handling times. a certain number of vehicles. So it's not, so the service level problems that exist today is today's taxpayer's problem. 
new development is only responsible for the incremental Paul, could, can I just understand forward. that, but is it is it like statutory that it's proportional, like using your numbers because there was a thousand base and the new is 15 that statutorily they can only be responsible for one third of the cost? Because it feels to me that there's a cliff effect here. Like when you go from a thousand to 1500, all of a sudden you've got this huge new expense to handle the 1500 that you didn't need for the thousand. It's not like you have, you know, an incremental expense of a third. And, but the statute prohibits you from charging that kind of cliff expense? That's our understanding from our consultant who uh, went through this analysis for us at the intersection of Kimball and Gregory. Huh. So. Okay. Well, it's sort of like the speed limits around uh, along 116. Well, the ZEMS are the same idea, or the, the school um, impact fee, right? It's only what the new incoming students require that that fee can, can cover. So even though it might need a new school, we can only cover what the impact fee, what those, you know, 20 to 50 new students, you know, per year would require. It's, it's, it's the same kind of thinking. Yeah. Do you have a question now? Not yet. Oh, not yet. Ooh, okay. <laughs> He's holding back on us. Okay. So are we all amenable to finding $10,000, just adding it to the general fund for sure. the um, sidewalks? Surplus. Or you want it from the surplus? Is that okay? It's okay with me. Sure. The increase is fine from wherever. <laughs> okay. I have a small increase that I would like to propose, and it has a funding source even. Um, several months ago, I, I was invited to uh, meet with the director of Turning Point, which is um, a small nonprofit in Burlington, and they deal with um, persons who are um, recovering from substance disorder. And they provide this service for, I think, most of the young people in Chittenden County, including a number, a great number from uh, South Burlington. And they were looking for a $5,000 um, contribution from each community. But we had already completed our uh, a, a service projects um, uh uh, funding for that year. And um, it occurred to me that we have money from the opi opioid um, trust fund. I can't remember how much came to the city. It wasn't on your list, but I know we got some. And it was more than $5,000. Um, Did that get redirected back to the state, though? I don't no. think so, no. And I we just have never discussed or thought about how to, I mean, maybe internally you have, um, but we haven't as a council. And it seems to me this is a, um, you know, really important service. We don't have anything like that in South Burlington. Our people go there and they seem to have um, a good track record with working with these individuals. So I would like to put that out there. I don't know what our opiate settlement dollar figure is. So far, we have received forty-four thousand nine hundred and six dollars. I'm sorry, how much? Forty-four thousand nine hundred and six dollars. Okay. So out of the forty-four thousand and change, I'd like to give them five thousand. Is that a, a static account that we have right now? That's cash on the side. Correct. Do you want to double to ten thousand? I mean. Well, we could. I mean, I'm, sh I'm sure they wouldn't say no. Sure it certainly would, yeah. is a growing um, right. problem. What other places could we use that money I mean, for, for what's intended? So I would make a recommendation. I think this is a great allocation. Staff totally support allocating five or 10000 to Turning Point. I think if you want to talk about um, allocating the total balance of the receipt, um, Chief Burke sits on the statewide opioid council, which is what's allocating the statewide settlement funding. So I think before you may, you fully spend all of those dollars, we should hear from him about how we can best leverage those funds 
um, to support what they're already doing. Um, I think if you want to do this now, five or 10,000, I think we're comfortable. Um, we, Martha and I talked with Chief Burke about that and he thought it was a great idea. Well, I would definitely support 10,000. I mean, we probably need 10 million, but um, you know, it goes. <laughs> you mentioned the social service awards. When, when in the year are those made? Um, in the summer. You can make them any time. Since I've been here, I don't know what you've done in the past. We've made them towards the end of the, the fiscal, fiscal year. year. Mm -hmm. um, like in June. I, mm -hmm. Martha and I have been talking about this as well. Um, again, since I've been here, I don't know what you did before. Um, those have all been allocated to the same um, partners. Mm -hmm. I think if we have some capacity this this spring, we would like to do a very quick RFP or, or a call to the community for funding requests. Um, and have them provide, you know, South Burlington residents served budget data, things like that. Right. And we, and we have a request in our packet tonight from. Um, yeah, Travis, turning point. Dr. From Child. Turning point. Oh, for Do Turning Point. No, yeah, this was. I'm sorry, for, from Dr. Child. So would that the source of that money be? So in terms of a budget, in terms of general fund budget, is there already an amount set up for the uh, for social service? There is 15000 in the budget. There's already a, an amount. Correct. 15000 is what it, the budget has carried for a good number of years now. I must have missed that in my review of all the lines. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, they're small. And and it used to be 30000 I think. And then we really tightened our budget mm -hmm. and decided to reduce that. And we actually just made, um, we also agreed that each um, recipient got approximately the same amount. Mm -hmm. And I also agree that some sort of reporting on the money would be helpful in terms of numbers and yeah. It was a bit time consuming for the council. I think we had a subcommittee, mm -hmm. <laughs> which I served, um, that reviewed all of these sure. and then came back and then we'd go back and forth. I mean, we probably spent, you remember, mm -hmm. quite a few hours on divvying up $30,000. Right. Mm -hmm. So we eventually got to the point where we said, do we have to have these same discussions every single year? Why don't we just, you know, have fewer and make it um, a more substantial award? I mean, we were literally giving $500 to some people and... Right. Right. Um, 300 and it, it just was um, not very satisfying right. for anyone probably I mean they all like the money they, they didn't return it saying it's, it's not enough but um, that's but you know I think looking at them again and having them um, there might be some new organizations that we're not even aware of. So, so I would make a motion to um, use ten thousand dollars of the opioid, whatever the fund is called, money um, to Turning Point. Second. Is there any further conversation or discussion? Okay. All in favor? Aye. Say aye. aye. So that carries. Thank you. Do you need a motion to warrant a public hearing for the budget? Uh, we do. We're not. We're not there yet. We're not, not quite, there. quite there yet. Sorry. Is there? But yes, we will. Yeah. So can I just bring up one other you thing may. that Martha called out in her memo to you? Um, there were two other, when we built the budget, there were two other uh, uses of surplus or ARPA funds that that we put out to you, 125000 for the Parks Master Plan and 200000 for the um, Hinesburg Shared Use Path. And we don't have firm understanding of what fund you would like to use to fund those two efforts. Offer. I'm hearing one ARPA. Do I have two more? Could you repeat the, the uses again? <laughs> the, parks, the, parks. the parks is on this, the memo, yeah. <laughs> we agreed to that. It's yeah. parks? Didn't print it. Oh, okay. Parks master plan and the Hinesburg Road shared use path grant Oh, match. great. Super. Yep. Yeah. We talked about the shared use I'm taking path. that as a yeah. yeah. So I think both of those to ARPA is okay with me. Yeah. Yep. yep. Those seem to be sort of long term and having a. Mm -hmm. Thank you for clarifying for us. Okay, and the road signal that was coming from. Surplus. Like, surplus. surplus. And impact. And impact. Yes. Yeah. 
but the 350 is surplus because the whole thing costs more than 350. 650. 650. Unbelievable for. That's the American way, though, right? Someone's making a lot of money. Would you like a motion now? But I Could don't I ask think I'm clear. Yes. On, oh, pardon? I don't think I'm clear on the 10000 for the bike pad paving. Is that surplus or are we adding? Oh, that's surplus? going to be surplus, too. Oh. Okay. Wasn't it the 10000 for the... Yeah. The curb. The curb things w yeah. was yep. ten was from... What's the curb thing? Not curb, the sidewalk. The sidewalk. Oh, yes. Okay. That was going to be... Um, it's the same one, right? Sidewalk and curb? Yeah. yeah. That was going to be surplus. Okay. So one so more. That's one. a total of what? 450 from surplus and 325 from ARPA. So one other question. Sixty from surplus. Right. Oh, that's right. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, three sixty. Various questions. <laughs> so one quick question about ARPA and um, rental registry. The um, have have we discussed the request for um, ARPA funds for the rental registry office? Has that been? That was in Steve's memo. Has that been? Was that? I assume that would be a capital, but you know, we I don't think we ever talked about actually how we would fund it, other than Steve came forward with some um, charges, you know, that we could accumulate and um, the fees and things, and then a capital expenditure that's a little floating still isn't hard. Um, and I think that the original thought was we would um, t use money from an enterprise fund, borrow it to build it, and we would pay it back over 20 years. Maybe? Over so, it's, so currently the plan, as we have ran the numbers, is um, based on a 10-year payback to the, to the general fund um, and trying to run it like an enterprise fund, but the fees in the proposed ordinance are not enough to cover without about a five hundred thousand dollar cash infusion from a one time either from fund balance or arpa unless you wanted to raise the fees to about 170 so right. to, to make it completely sustainable i thought the fees were paying for the people so the fees are paying for the people and paying back the one about 1.2 million, it's going to take about 1.7 million to to do the um, addition. Mm -hmm. To do a 10 year payback with a hundred and fifty dollar payment, it needs about a five hundred thousand dollar cash infusion. Okay. So we we never talked about yeah. using ARPA for that, but we certainly can. Because right. what do we have left now? Um, remaining ARPA was seven, uh, one point seven million, and we just decided to spend three hundred and twenty-five. Right? One point. So it's <laughs> one point <laughs> two um, three hundred and. Um, 76, right? 1.37. Yeah. Well. Does that need a motion or is it just part of the discussion? Well, let so, me just discuss it a little bit. If you guys would like to allocate that tonight, knock yourselves out. I think that allocating it before you have an ordinance yeah. in place might yeah. be a little right, premature. Right. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I would wait. All right, wait. Okay. You can always reallocate it in the future if you want to do it. It's, it's yeah. similar to the previous discussion about <laughs> making right. it. <laughs> that well, we could well. certainly <laughs> think about this as an option, <laughs> and maybe not even all of it, but just half of okay, it. Okay, great. Yeah. You can split, the, split it too, but just right. put it does right. kind of raise the question of the fees, whether we should go to 170 with the notion that in a decade we'll lower them back down to 150. Right. Right. Not a big right. 20 bucks a year for nothing ever goes down, you know. But I'm just saying, right? I mean, it's something we could do, and not. I, 
I mean, when we get there, I'm not going to be supportive of using half a million Whopper dollars for this. Okay. But it can be something that's discussed for sure. Okay. Other things? You need a motion to schedule the hearing? The, the public yeah, are there any other thoughts or or additions or cuts to the budget that anyone is What's the final tax rate increase around? that I can publish to people? Five point five three five point eight two. Five point eight two. Well, that sounds much more reasonable. Okay, so we need a motion. You need a motion. To so I would move that we uh, warn a public hearing for the FY25 budget on January 16th at a regular city council meeting. And second. CIP. Oh, and CIP. Oh, and the CIP as well. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All righty. Thank you all. Thank you. So now we move on to the sustainability report. Um, when it, we are ahead of time, but we could do a quick little break. We're almost done. So I'd like to call back to order the South Burlington City Council meeting of December 18th, 2023. Our last one in 2023. Right? We don't have any next week. <laughs> um, and we'll move on to item 12, which is receiving the city's annual sustainability report. And Paul Connor, Director of Planning and Zoning, will share that with us. I'll be brief. Here <laughs> it is. No, no, this has been a big year. Uh, a lot of work has been done um, outlined in the report. Happy to answer any questions. I did want to draw your attention to the very last paragraph where um, we will likely be submitting a unified planning work program request that you will see at your Janu one of your January meetings to the RPC to uh, begin to do the um, analyses both from the big picture of the inputs in terms of total vehicle, vehicle miles traveled, total carbon uh, being used in the city, as well as on the targets in terms of things like total numbers of vehicles registered in South Burlington that are EVs and plug-in hybrids, that kind of thing. Um, so this next year will be our first year where we start to get some real data. Um, this year is a little more qualitative as a uh, report, but there are the beginnings of our quantitative metrics in there around some of the ordinances you passed as well. So happy to field any questions that folks might have. The, yeah, they can gas up on Shelburne Road. <laughs> the fire trucks, they don't have to go all the way. Yes, that was the savings. The yeah, yeah. And that's a really exciting one. So many people were jazzed by that work, I think, by Lou and Nick going over and hearing the question of, you know, what, why do we have to do this? And just, it didn't take a lot of digging to discover right. that we didn't have to. Um, but we've always done it that way. And and that's how things get, I mean, that's not a, meant to be, um, you know, offensive. It's with everything. It doesn't offend me at all. No, I think it's perfectly yeah. Yeah. great for that. Um, Will this report also include some of the improvements that um, the schools have made? Is there a way to integrate that? That's that. We can certainly reach out to our partners at the schools if that's something you would like for us to um, ask them to share, and then it'd be somewhat of a joint report. Um, we're well, I'm happy thinking, to do that. Um, you know, when I went to the I don't know what it was. It wasn't the christening of all the um, electric buses, but they were celebrating them. And they had saved um, it was huge. I can't remember now, but it was a very impressive dollar figure and number of gallons of fuel that they didn't use because the buses had driven I don't know, like 79,000 miles in a year, the four buses. It was just astronomical. And so, um, and I'm sure they're doing other things in terms of, you know, using LED lights and junk like that. So um, 
it, I think it would be really helpful for the public to understand and see in real metrics what the entire city is doing to meet these goals. So I think it would be important to include um, the school and also include, probably not in this um, uh, work with CCRPC, but um, we really need to figure out how to present this to the public in ways they understand, appreciate, and can, um, you know, generate support for that. And, and we don't do that as well as we might. And I think as we go forward with climate change, it's going to be more and more important to make sure that they um, understand, you know, how far we've come as well as how far we need to go. So I would hope that that's part of absolutely. The plan. I you know I think moving forward as we move into the more quantitative um, work, it becomes a much more graphic presentation, and then the pieces of it can be shared via our um, city news and social media and made available in a lot more accessible ways. Um, the first couple of years are sort of necessarily very programmatic. You know, we mm -hmm. put together mm -hmm. a plan. We can pull out pieces of the plan, but it doesn't excite as many people uh, as data. <laughs> no, but little pieces like saving however many gallons of gas for the um, fire trucks and however many gallons of gas with electric buses, that's real to people, I think. Absolutely. And it helps, um, you know, paint the picture. Yes. What, what about the commercial space permits that you've you've had since December? Um, do you have any idea how many kilowatts of solar might be installed there? Do they have to furnish that information on the permit application, or is it sort of an artifact and you don't know? Uh, they need to demonstrate uh, the amount. Let's see. There, there was a fair amount of discussion about how this is going to be done. Um, it's that they have reasonably maximized the area. Right. Um, the planning commission then and decided not to try to go into a whole kilowatt analysis mm -hmm. with the 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 key thing being let's get them on the roof um, or wherever they're going to be. So we will know the area that will be um, including them, but not necessarily a kilowatt, unless they're requesting that they produce less because of some oddity of the building. They don't have to produce more than the building would um, would would generate. Um, so they might provide us that information that way, but otherwise it's they just need to provide us the area of solar. Will we ever know the, the, the amount of energy that they would produce in that area later on? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure that we are have it as a permit requirement of them, whether it's something that we can partner with Green Mountain Power to start to collect, I'm not sure. We can certainly follow up on that, though. Because that would be one nice thing to measure, is that yep. you know, we've issued 12 permits, and two years later, the buildings are constructed, and it's 15,000 kilowatts, you know, of added power. I mean, right. <clears throat> okay. With the houses, it's more difficult, because it ends up being sometimes just the homeowner's choice after it's been built, and you don't know if they'll ever do it. So we can change that. No. <laughs> um, any other comments? Yes, Andrew. So, just um, in that same vein, do we have insight into Paul for the folks that have the twenty-four new homes and the commercial space that have been under the um, primary heating system ordinance? Do we have insight into how those folks have been complying? Mm -hmm whether they have natural gas backup, whether they decide to go all electric. And I think, I think that information would be useful um, to, to understand how the rollout's going, but also to inform us in terms of um, potential future changes. If everyone has decided that, you know what, the technology is sufficient, we're going to go all electric, we're, we're good with it, you know, we don't need a fossil fuel backup, um, I would be, you know, of a mind to tighten up the ordinance, for instance. 
Um, I'm not aware of our knowledge just yet on it. It is um, possible that the fire prevention team has some more knowledge and I'm happy to follow up with them on it. Um, the 24 new homes is uh, nine of them are in one building that also has the 5,000 square feet of commercial. So that's one building. And then the, the remainder are in small buildings each. So it's likely mostly single and two family homes and then this one building so far. Um, so uh, we can reach out to the fire prevention team. We can also informally, at least initially, uh, ask the builders and um, communicate with folks like Efficiency Vermont to see if they're tracking it could because certainly any and all of these things are presumably the builders are taking advantage of um, uh, rebates and programs through Efficiency Vermont and they were um, close partners with us as we did the vetting of this ordinance at the beginning so yeah, it'd be great to get more color the, the other reason person why it would be good to get more color I know I've had conversations with with other municipalities that are um, very seriously hoping to copy what we've done and our experience will help inform mm -hmm. their conversations and, and there are other conversations taking place that I think our experience would help inform. So any color we can have on that front would be really useful. Okay. Do we need to, we don't need to accept this, do we? I'm sorry, I have, I have a few other. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so me? just, um, so I, I love the report. I know we're, we're doing a lot. I know we've done a lot. Um, I wrote down this whole thing about what came out with COP28, but I don't want to bore everyone. Everyone knows that, like, it's a planned emergency, and, you know, the quotes that came out of there are frightening. So I would really like us to see us move even faster, particularly on LDR changes. I think there's just a lot of low-hanging fruit that's still out there we talked about enhanced EV charging, maybe splitting out the rent of a parking space for an apartment. Um, you know, we talked about maybe regulating small gas engines, blowers, trimmers in the thermal space. We've got Burlington's example for um, ensuring that rental units, existing rental units become more efficient over time and better weatherized. We, we learned we do have the um, power authority to regulate existing um, fossil fuel infrastructure in buildings when they get a permit. So we have all this stuff that we can do. And I would really, really encourage us to like move at the speed of trust and continue to to chip away and do these things and keep them on our agenda and, and, and worry about them and move them forward. They're, you know, they're not going to cost the city money. And we've got examples of other folks doing them. And I just, I, I personally would like to move faster in this space. Okay, yes, Jesse. Very excited that you're willing to put staffing in the FY25 budget to do this work. And we can also do some of this work on the council, honestly. So, um, go for it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Other comments or thoughts? Well, how do, how, how do you go, how do you propose doing that? Um, if the council is amenable to putting some of these items on the agenda, I'm happy to push them forward. Which items are you talking about? Well, the ones I just listed. Oh, okay. Well, they'd have to go through planning commission, right, to become proposed. Well, we did solar right? directly here, right? The solar commercial. Well, the planning commission likes to have a sense from the council, do they not, of what we would like them to focus on, and they have a fair amount on their plate now so they you know that's a conversation mm -hmm. that goes back and forth right the, for the things that are within their purview they do have some elements of the work plan that involve um, following up on the climate action plan included in that is uh, they'll be getting an analysis in either the second meeting in January or first meeting in February on EV charging facilities so that is underway um, staffs developing that right now some of the others that Councillor Chalnick you spoke about um, would live with the council unless you chose to give them to another committee. Is there are there changes in in the works for LER for for new commercial buildings to require X number of or uh, you know parking spots to be to have car chargers level twos or 
so as I just said, um, yes, that's something we're going to be providing an analysis to okay. the commission to in the next six weeks to eight, six to eight weeks. Um, we are first looking at the new commercial building energy codes and, and residential building energy codes. Um, we're just wrapping up an analysis that there's a new set of statewide rules that are coming out uh, that will apply to all new construction that um, sets a foundation of that exact subject. Okay. Well, that's a start. And then if there's other items that, I mean, that sounds like a great start. Um, if there's other items that <clears throat> the, um, you know, Andrew would like to push forward, he just needs to find one other person who says, yeah, let's put it on the agenda. We can talk about it. And if we want to direct the planning commission to work on some enhanced LDR, we can. And I would agree with you. We need to do this to sweet. But would you also consider? Um, you, so I think you mentioned prohibiting certain tools. That that would not be a planning commission item. That would be an ordinance, wouldn't that it? That would be an ordinance. That's right. I think we could do that through our noise ordinance, for right. instance. Yeah. Yeah, um, that, yeah. And I think that would not be a heavy lift. Okay. Great. All righty. So we don't need to ad adopt this or anything. We just need to hear it and read it. Can I make a side comment? You may. So I just wanted to say that um, I have a friend that, that is renting in a new apartment building in Morrisville. And it's got a split system. It's got an electric water heater, but it's not a hybrid heat pump type water heater. And so he's been there for, I think, a little bit over a month. He got his first bill. So we've been trying to work together to figure out how much the heat pump is, is costing to heat the place, right? So he's been looking at his bill. Um, unfortunately, the I think the utility doesn't provide you know that the hour by hour or you know um, web you know presence for graphs and to we understand could look usage. Over last year's bill. And no, no, he just moved in. It's a brand wow. new building. So, but it's been interesting going through the process of trying to figure out how much he actually paid in electricity to heat this seven hundred square foot apartment. You know, so we've got a little bit of information, you know, it's like a hundred dollars plus, but we're not sure how much was water, you know, and the lighting isn't very much refrigerator, you know, and then turn off up. the hot water heater for well, a he, month. He, he did that for a little while when he was gone. Right. So, but one, once he right. understands if, if the, if the utility has a website that lets him in, that looks at hour by hour, smart meter usage, then you can start trying to you know, dissect that and figure out how much power is the heat pump is taking. But so far, so good, you know, so. That's yeah. great. The whole building is like that. Even so, all of the units have got to have their own electric water heater. They they don't have a natural gas fired central water. So anyway, nice. just that little side comment. Okay. Well, thank you, Paul. We'll move on to item thirteen. Convene as the South Burlington Liquor Control Commission to consider first class licenses for and third class restaurant and bar license and an outside. Ugh. Consumption permit. Who wants to be outside in this weather? <laughs> so I would entertain a motion to enter the South Burlington Liquor Control Board. I'll make that. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And we have three licenses to consider. So I would entertain a motion for Old Post and Windjammer in the poorhouse. So moved. Second. Any discussion? <clears throat> All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 <coughs> okay, that passes. It's unanimous. I'm out of the South Bronson Liquor Control Board. And I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. 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 So we are back to normal here. <laughs> Other business, item 14? <laughs> We're not normal, she said. <laughs> okay, if there's, I see, seeing no more business, I just want to wish everyone a really happy holiday and um, safe travels. If you're going somewhere, I know you're going to go out west. And um, if you're staying here, we can all pray for a little snow. No snow. <laughs> no snow. No snow, I know. Not it's happen. coming. Okay. Long-term weather forecast is for the early part of next year to have colder than average temperatures. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, that doesn't mean I snow, though. I read on the though. internet, so it must be true. Right, right exactly. <laughs> All right. Entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Hey, guys. 50 minutes.